I'm Brian Borum. Uh, as the picture says, I work for a company called Weaveworks, which is an open source software company. Um, and uh, before we get started, can we, can we get a show of hands? Who, um, uh, who already knows Kubernetes? Uh, almost, well, let's say two thirds. Okay. Uh, Docker? More? Linux? Yeah, it's just checking. Uh, who knows IP tables? Oh, no. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I put in, uh, the, this is ancient wisdom, that, that it, after the zombie apocalypse, um, you're going to need someone in your party who, uh, you know, someone who can hunt, someone who can heal, and, and someone who knows IP tables. So, um, uh, what I am here to talk about, um, so a, a way of blocking unwanted traffic. So the basic idea that uh, uh, I'm going to wave my hands around. It's kind of dark, isn't it? Can, can you tell I have hands? Yes, there, there are people waving back at me. So, um, uh, so the basic idea that you have uh, group A things, and they're allowed to talk to group B things, and they're not allowed to talk to group C things. I'm going to talk about that in the context of Kubernetes, which is an orchestrator, a thing that runs software for you on many, many machines. Um, I'm going to tell you how we implemented that in an open source program, um, which is part of WeaveNet. Uh, OK, so this is some kind of security um, uh, talk. So we have to have a threat model. Uh, so this is my threat model. The big guy is very big and very angry and is coming after you. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we have our um, threat on the left-hand side. We have our network on the right-hand side. And we put a firewall in between them. Uh, that's how we keep them out. Um, the uh, problem is this doesn't always work. Um, if the attacker gets inside your network, uh, he is now free to hit any node on the system, because they're all connected. Um, worse than that, uh, well, it, it may not even be an attacker. You know, this, this may actually just be the, the dev version of your software that you managed to release to, to production by mistake. Um, you know, this, this could be uh, not even malicious. It could just be randomly attacking your, uh, your system. Um, so, so what do we want to do? Um, uh, we want to put a bunch more firewalls in there. And, uh, and, and stop this, right? We want to we wanna stop all that unwanted traffic. Now, um, imagine doing that in an environment which is very, very dynamic, where things can come and go all the time, where things can auto-scale up and down. Um, more machines, fewer machines running uh, containers, running um, under uh, control of a, an orchestrator, which is just firing them up wherever it feels like. Uh, so it's a very, very dynamic environment. So that's, that's the problem we have to solve. Uh, OK, so I'm going to take an example just to show you a little bit more uh, about how this works in Kubernetes, how you, how you specify this. Um, so as a fairly typical example, like a three-tier system where the uh, presentation is supposed to talk to the middle tier, but it's not supposed to talk to the data tier. So this. Um, if you can read that, this is how you would write a network policy in Kubernetes. Uh, there's a YAML file. This is actually like what it would look like. Pasted it in. Um, so it has some metadata at the top saying it's a policy. Uh, and then we say uh, the presentation tier will only accept ingress on port 80. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, that's how you set up those rules in Kubernetes. Um, what do we mean by a tier call on presentation? In Kubernetes, you can label anything you like. Uh, in particular, you label uh, pods, which are a pod. A pod is the abstraction of your running software. A pod is really a collection of containers, one container perhaps, or more than one container, um, which go together. So, so we label our containers. Uh, here's a little bit more complicated rule. Um, this one says, anything in the middle tier uh, will only accept input from anything in the presentation tier. Uh, so this time we said where it's coming from, and we did not say anything about ports. And we can kind of mix and match that. We can, we can re restrict the protocols, the ports, the 
uh, where it's coming from, where it's going to. So that is Kubernetes network policy that was added as a specification about a year ago. And there are three or four implementations of that specification. Uh, so how do we implement it? Well, this is an open source conference. Uh, get over to GitHub and read the source. Um, no? OK, you expected me to do more work. OK. Uh, so this is a, a kind of high-level architecture diagram of um, how this works. We run, uh, we run a daemon process on every host. So in this picture, I have two hosts. Um, and uh, Kubernetes has this uh, master uh, service which knows everything about what's going on. So we set up a, a watch. Uh, this is within the Kubernetes API. Uh, we say, I want to be notified of all changes um, and in particular to, to network policies and pods. So I'm going to, I'm going to get calls over that API when any of those things change. Um, then we drive IP tables. I told you that was important. Um, how does that work? Well, we uh, inject into the top level forwarding chain a rule that, uh, that says we're going to check some rules under the, oops, don't do that. And we're going to uh, oh, don't do that either. OK. Uh, we're going to check some rules under the uh, heading of Weave NPC, Network Policy Controller. If we do not pass those rules, then drop the packet. So that's the most important thing. We fail safe. Um, the next thing we do is, is we say, if, if, this is, um, if this is an established connection, then accept the packet. This is a, a performance hack. We don't want to check every pack it. We only want to check the ones that open a new connection. Um, so the first thing we do is we say if it's an already established connection, then accept it. Um, and otherwise, we check a couple of other chains. What are we going to do in those chains? We, we need to, uh, so this is kind of flow of the system. We, we start with uh, the source address on the network. Uh, that's going to go over a bridge, Linux bridge. Um, and in the course of traversing that bridge, it's going to get run through the IP tables rules. And we make use of this other thing called an IP set. Who, who knows about IP sets? Oh, much fewer. OK. OK, so today you learned something. So, um, so an IP set is a pretty useful thing, because um, in a large Kubernetes system, there could be thousands of pods. There could be thousands of combinations of source and destination IP addresses that we want to either accept or reject. Um, and if we wrote a rule for each one of those, then it would start to get slower and slower and slower because uh, it's kind of a linear search. An IP set is a hash table uh, into which we can put the same information. We can put the source, the destination, the port, uh, and we can match against that in a um, unit time approximately operation. Uh, and if it passes, we send it to the destination. Um, so just because you're enjoying this so much, we'll take a look at the exact uh, syntax of those rules. Um, so we say we're using the set module. It's like an, an add-on module for IP tables. Uh, but it you know, ships in every distro. Um, and we're going to match a set with a very, very funny name. Uh, and if, uh, so there's two kinds. There's a the kind where we just match on the destination. That's the kind of default set. And then there's the, what we call the ingress chain, where we match on both the set source and the destination. So that just depends. Back in those policies, it depends whether the admin specified uh, anything about the, um, the source or just about the destination. Uh, why the funny names? Um, so basically, this is an encoding the, uh, the space of names so each one of these corresponds to a network policy in Kubernetes. And, and the length of name you can have in Kubernetes is longer than the length of name you can have in uh, IP tables. So we kind of crunched them down and made use of some extra characters that uh, it's a little bit like base64 encoding, except it's base86 encoding. And, uh, or anyway. Um, OK, uh, so that, those are the chains. That works. That's what we do. Um, uh, it is incredibly easy to get these things wrong um, when you are specifying the rules. Uh, if you get it wrong, it will drop your traffic. 
when you didn't want it to. Um, so we add one more rule at the top level. We, we use the uh, NF log, net filter logging um, technique or, or, or rule destination, whatever you call that thing. Um, and then we pick that up in our program. Uh, we use uh, ulogd just to, to subscribe to that. Uh, uh, we, we use channel 86 because uh, to eight, that's kind of slang, 86 it, is get rid of it. Um, so that's those, we log connections that get dropped by our um, uh, daemon. And we also export that as a, as a metric that can be picked up as something like Prometheus. So you can, you can alert, if you suddenly get a lot of rejected connections, then that means either you have some kind of attacker in your system or you misconfigured it. Um, and, and both of those things are interesting things to be monitoring. So we uh, export those. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, blog post is the first link. Uh, if you're interested to read more about how it works, uh, it has a walkthrough of how you can set it up and try it out. The um, code is on GitHub. Uh, it is all written in Go. Um, and, uh, and we also have a, a, a cloud uh, service where you can kind of run all this stuff hosted. Um, so that's pretty much what I came to say. Thank you. Thank you. So do you have any questions? We have another maybe uh, well, five minutes for questions. One in there. Okay. So. Gonna get some exercise. Sorry, where was it? Uh, back uh, about six more rows. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the talk. I have actually have two questions. Okay. The first one is: uh, It doesn't seem like you need to use Weave as a SDN provider, but I think maybe we need because I didn't see any connection between Weave as a SDN provider and Weave as the network policy controller. Yeah. And the second question. Well, shall, shall I answer that one and then come back to, the, to your other one? Uh, is, is that okay? Uh, so, so you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the program that we implemented is, is uh, fully generic. It will uh, work uh, in any situation where you can persuade IP tables to check the uh, source and destination and port of your packet. Um, we only ship it as part of WeaveNet because, uh, because you, do, you do need to somehow start the process. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to just tell IP tables to run our rules on every packet on the machine because we only want to run the rules for the packets that belong to Kubernetes. So, um, uh, so there's, there's like a few lines of config to, to send. Basically, you need to know like the name of the bridge or something like that in order to start the process off. Uh, but your, your uh, observation is absolutely correct that the Weave NPC is a standalone program and it just so happens that we ship it alongside our SDN. The, the two things do not need each other. And thank you. And second question, what happens if we implement a new network policy that blocks uh, uh, a connection that was already established? And uh, does it do anything? Does it? Right. Uh, yeah, it does not because of that, uh, because of that, that performance hack where we, um, if I can find that rule. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this thing where, where we, we don't want to impose the lookup overhead on every packet, we only do it on connection establishment. So if you manage to establish a connection, uh, that will stay active. Um, so we, we did discuss, I'm, I'm a member of the Kubernetes SIG network committee, and we did discuss this point that we felt like if, if the bad guy got in already, then you know, that's, that's too bad, reboot the machine or something like that. If you, if you want to drop that connection, uh, that's not within the uh, scope of Kubernetes network policy to drop already active connections. Thank you. We, well, we have a question. We have time for another two, two minutes for another question or two. If somebody is interested. Quick, think of something. Oh, one in the middle there. That's like the worst the possible middle, place. Yes. <laughs> Can you just do sign language? 
Uh, do, do you have any numbers in terms of uh, basically performance on escalation? So at, at the point that you start having more containers, basically you start having more rules of EP tables. Does this affect and so how the performance? Right, you're, you're asking about performance. So the, the design of the system is that there's one rule per policy. Uh, the number of containers should not um, impact the performance because it's the, each, each source destination is a hash table lookup. Um, so it's designed to remain uh, the same speed uh, as the number of containers or pods in Kubernetes grows. Um, it will slow down very slightly uh, as you add more policies uh, because each policy has to be checked to see if it applies. 